Today's lecture is going to be a continuation of this theme of exact recovery. So I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of the buzzword compressed or compress compressive sensing? Some of you. Okay. It's somehow like, it's actually very CS-esque, but sort of comes from different fields. So not all, some computer scientists don't actually hear about it. So I'm glad after this lecture all of you will know about it. Um, so you know, just to remind you what the theme was, we're sort of in the middle of studying uh, problems that are generally NP-hard. Uh, but we're asking about additional conditions on the input under which a heuristic, which normally would not solve it optimally, because it's a polynomial time heuristic and an NP hard problem, but under these extra conditions, actually this heuristic does recover an optimal solution. So two lectures ago, we were talking about stable k-median instances, and we looked at the single link plus plus algorithm, which basically optimizes only over a subset of the possible solution, so it can do it in polynomial time. But we showed that if k-median instances are stable, then actually the optimal solution is guaranteed to be in that restricted part of the space, and it's actually going to recover the optimal solution. Then on Wednesday, we studied uh, cut problems. ST cut was our warm up, and then in multi way cuts, and we looked at a linear programming relaxation, which again generally is you know, not going to be optimal, but if it's a stable instance, then linear programming does give you the optimal solution. Uh, so those were cases. Um, uh, right, so this lecture is going to be uh, another one in that same theme, and this is about solving linear systems. So consider the problem, uh, you're given A, you're given B, you want to solve for X. A are just real values, they can be anything, so it's just your typical linear system. But imagine uh, A isn't square, but rather imagine there are fewer rows than columns. Okay, so there's your A, there's your X, and there's your B, your right hand side. So. Uh, how many solutions, feasible solutions, does a linear system like this have? There's actually sort of two answers to that question. It could be one of two things. Either what or what. Well, it could be none, right? It could just be, you know, you have a couple contradictory constraints. What if you do have one solution? Is it going to be unique? No. There's actually going to be an infinite number of feasible solutions, right? So, um, because it's an underdetermined system, all right? So, if m equals n and it's full rank, if it's invertible, then there's a unique solution, namely a inverse b. But in general, if you have fewer rows, fewer constraints than degrees of freedom in x, you have an infinite number of solutions whenever you have one. One sort of heuristic way to think about this is it's almost like, as computer scientists, you can almost think of it like each row of this system gives you one bit of information about x. Okay, not really a bit, because these are real numbers, but it gives you like, it pins down sort of one of the degrees of freedom, right? So if x is in Rn, then there are n degrees of freedom. So to know it uniquely, you need to pin down all n degrees of freedom. So you need n constraints. So if you pin down only m of them, there's still the subspace of rank n minus m of feasible solutions, okay? So it's an underdetermined linear system. I'll, I'll, shortly, I'll tell you why one might want to care about these things. Uh, but let me just sort of say what's going to be the nature of the computational problem. Basically, amongst this infinite number of feasible solutions, we're going to be interested in singling out the one which is somehow the most, the best, or the most meaningful. And uh, in compressive sensing, the definition of meaningfulness is sparsity. Okay. So we call a vector x k sparse if all of its entries are zeros except for most k of them. Okay, so most k non-zeros. So I'm going to use the notation SUPP of x. This denotes the support. By definition, that's the set of coordinates on which x is non-zero. So the number of non-zeros is at most k. Okay. And, you know, for concrete values, maybe think of k, you know, if x has length n, maybe think of k as like root n, maybe even log n. Okay, so those would be, it's not, we don't want to think of it as constant, think of it as bigger than constant, uh, but much smaller than n. Okay? All right, so the perspective of this lecture, or really of this topic, is that sparse solutions are more meaningful. And there are many applications where this seems like a quite justified assumption. I mean, a couple caveats. 
So, you know, in, in applications, there's usually kind of two twists on sparsity that you need to make it really practical. The first one is, is like, okay, so, you know, maybe the vector isn't like zero in n minus k coordinates, but it's really small in n minus k coordinates. Okay, so sort of most of its mass is concentrated on just k coordinates. So that's the first kind of relaxation you want to do. The second thing is a lot of real applications, you're sparse not in sort of the standard basis, but in some other basis. So like the Fourier and wavelet bases are popular ones. And so, but the point is everything I'm going to tell you about today in this lecture, both the results and the way the results are obtained, also extend, you know, really quite elegantly to those extensions, to having approximate notions of sparsity or sparsity in bases other than the standard one. So for the lecture, let's just keep it simple. I'm only going to talk about exact sparsity, and we're only going to be thinking about sparsity meaning the standard basis. So there's literally just, in, in the x that we're looking for, there's k non-zeros and the rest are zeros. Okay? All right. So then, the computational problem we're thinking about, again, has this exact recovery flavor where there's some ground truth or some planted solution out there. We want to know when can we get it back. Okay? So recover... Some ground truth k sparse solution. Okay, so we're given A, we're given B. Let's think of it as we know k. We're going to assume that there's some k sparse solution, and the question is, can we get it back? Okay. So that's going to be the kind of problem that we're thinking about. All right. So why why think about this? So let me tell you about sort of the compressive sensing narrative. So here, it's sort of a shift in how we're usually thinking about it, right? Normally we think of sort of, you know, the input is like, you know, coming down from the skies and we just have to deal with it. Right? We're just given this A and B. And, uh, and so we've talked about some things like what are some conditions on A and B where hopefully, you know, if nature is providing this input, you know, maybe, you know, it has extra structure and we can do some exact recovery. The compressive sensing narrative actually, you're usually responsible for actually designing the A and B. Okay, so if you studied error correcting codes, it's sort of in the spirit of error correcting codes, where you know, you, if you're going to have a linear code, you know, maybe that um, uh, defines an encoding, and you want to somehow choose a matrix A to make your life easy later, like it's easy to decode, for example. So it's sort of similar here. And so the way one normally thinks of it in compressive sensing is you think of, you know, there is some vector x, so forget about A and B for a second, there just is an x, okay, some ground truth, a signal, they would call it. And that could be, uh, you know, like something like some image you're trying to reconstruct or something like that. And the point, and then you make measurements, you somehow try to access this ground truth x. And the way one thinks about it is one thinks about a row of this linear system as a quote unquote linear measurement of x. So think about it this way. Each row of this matrix, right, so this is an n vector, and this entry over here is just the dot product of this row with x. Okay, so each entry of b is just some encoded version of x. Okay, it's x dot product, inner product with some other vector. So in that sense, it's each of these can be thought of as a linear measurement of x. So the more values of b you get, the more linear measurements you take, it seems like the more information you're getting at about this unknown x that you'd like to recover. Okay? And so then what people think about is, okay, how can we actually design measurements? How can we actually design these linear systems so that you know, from A and B, we can actually recover what X is. Now, we already talked about how, you know, the, sort of the obvious approach would be, well, why not just take N linearly independent measurements, right? So why not just find an N by N matrix A, which is invertible, and then if you're also given the right-hand side, you just multiply both sides by A minus 1, and you recover X. So that would be N rows, okay? N measurements. So the whole deal in compressive sensing says, well, what if we assume more about the structure of the unknown signal x, and in exchange, perhaps we can get away with fewer measurements, that is, fewer rows, okay? So by contrast, if you think just about k-sparse vectors, now intuitively there's not as many degrees of freedom, there's not as much unknown about what x could be, so the hope would be that many fewer measurements suffice, okay? So that's sort of the idea. So what are some applications? Well, so like, one buzzword you can look up, uh, which was sort of popular early in the field, was the single pixel camera. So I'm not going to say much about this, I'll just sort of tell you the idea. But 
you know, so it's, it's widely thought and sort of, you know, empirically validated that, that images that people take in the real world are in some sense sparse. Okay? Not sparse in sort of the obvious basis, but there'll be some other well-studied basis, like a wavelet basis, under which real images are sparse, or approximately sparse. I mean, indeed, if you think about sort of signals which sort of don't have any sparse representation, people usually think of those as like random noise. Okay? So real images have sparse representations in some sense. And so somehow like the, the sort of obvious way to sort of take advantage of that, that you might first think about is like, okay, you get your camera, you pack in as many pixels in you, as you can, so you just get as much information as possible when you take the actual photo. You know, and then later you run some compression algorithm on it and it squeezes it down. Okay? And probably you can squeeze it down to something much smaller than what the camera took without really losing anything as far as being able to reconstruct it later. So the idea here is, well, you know, wouldn't it actually kind of be a lot smarter if at the end of the day we're just going to have this compressed representation? Why don't we just actually have the camera just like actually take that compressed representation right away? I mean, the image it wants to take is already low dimensional, it was already sparse, so why not just take a small amount of information now for later reconstruction? So in that context, you want to think about X as, as sort of the, the you know, sparse representation of the image being taken. And then you can think of these linear measurements as just things like you know, random dot products of the you know, uh, light intensity at each of the pixels in the camera. Okay? So you really, you're literally just, let's remember, this is one number. Right? This is a whole bunch of numbers, like the light intensity of all the different pixels. And you can think of, a, if you choose this to be a random row, then this is going to be a random inner product between your image and some and some dot product. And so then what this would say is actually, rather than just storing, in the naive way, the light intensity of every pixel, you just store all these random linear combinations and you can get the image back later. Okay? Another application is in MRI, so magnetic uh, resonance imaging. And so there, so this is where you, you know, you're trying to take a scan, like of someone's brain or some other part of their body. And so there the number of measurements like literally corresponds to the length of time of this scan. Okay? And when you get an MRI, you've got to stay really still, depending on what you're taking a scan of. You might even have to like not breathe. So it's pretty clear that less measurements, meaning less of a scan time, can be a pretty big win. Okay? So that's why people care about this kind of stuff. Okay. So that leads to the questions: how small can a linear system be so that at least in principle, so that at least in principle you have enough information to recover a K-sparse vector? But then also, of course, we don't just want to know that you know, there's some unique sparse reconstruction, we also want a fast algorithm that finds it. Okay, so we want to answer both of those questions. All right. So, uh, for this to be doable, again, let's sort of think about the lines in the sand. So we need some assumptions about what the matrix A is. All right. So the first thing we've sort of already we've already sort of touched on, which is that you know a we want it to be non-trivially small, so we want it to have fewer than n rows, but there's going to be some limit on how few rows we can get at. Right, so like imagine a had just one row, okay? Imagine like k was 10, okay? So there are these various sparse vectors that x might be, and we have no idea which one. We just know it's some 10 sparse vector, and imagine it's like an a with one row. So we take one linear measurement, we get back like seven, right? Like this is clearly not enough information to like reconstruct which of the k sparse vectors the real world is. Okay, so you know, so the first naive thought might be, okay, well, we said we kind of needed you know one row to pin down each degree of freedom that x might have. Okay, and the first thought might be, oh, as a k sparse vector, that's kind of like k degrees of freedom. But it's actually a little more complicated than that, right? Because like think even just about like zero one vectors that are k sparse. So remember, x has length n. Okay. So the number of 0, 1 k sparse vectors, that's the number of ways to choose the k coordinates of the support out of n, so like n choose k. So that's something like n to the k such k sparse vectors. So just thinking sort of heuristically, if we think of each row of the matrix, maybe it's giving us like one bit of information. Again, that doesn't really make sense, but just heuristically. Maybe we get a bit of information from each row of the matrix, then to kind of pin down uniquely which of these n choose k possible sparse vectors it is, we're going to need log of n choose k uh, rows, okay, which is basically like uh, k log n, okay, Jeremy? Uh, but if x were 0, 1, couldn't you pick like primes or something on one, so like consider the single row that like had, I, I, I suspect that if x is 0, 1, you can do something with a single row. Yeah. Okay, I, I guess, I mean, this is the point is like think about the supports, suppose, it's an, uh, suppose it's an unknown support, 
Okay. Right. And it turns out, so if you think about it for a second, you realize that actually if you knew the support of x, then you could recover it, right? Because you just force the other coordinates to be zero, and then you'd have a normal linear system, and you'd, recall, you'd resolve for the unique solution x. So it kind of boils down to knowing what the support is. Okay, and there's n choose k choices for the support. Right. You okay. can find it if you don't have any, like, bound on, like, if x is zero, one, and you don't have any bound on, like, the size of the entries in a, I think, with a single row. Okay. But I mean, I'm just trying to motivate, so there's going to be this k log n I'm trying to motivate where it comes from. Okay, and the point is there's n choose k choices of a support, and sort of the best case seems like you get a bit of information for each row. Okay. So e.g., uh, maybe we're going to hope for something like <coughs> m better be at least k log n. Actually, it can be, it can be slightly smaller than this, but uh, I'm just going to stick with this for lecture. Okay. So m has to be sufficiently big, but again, we want it to be way less than n. Okay. So like k log n, we'd be pretty happy with if we're thinking of k as being root n or log n or something like that. This would be way less than n. And again, I hope you have the intuition that like k we don't think is enough. There should be some dependence on n because of this freedom of which of the n coordinates are actually in the, in the support. Okay, but so that's actually, that's also not enough. Even if you take m to be, you know, something like this, there's still going to be some a's, certain matrices a for which this is not going to work. Even if it's say full rank, okay, full row rank. Like think of it a as like super sparse. Okay, so maybe all I do is I pick you know, uh, m different columns, and I stick a single one in each. Okay. So now, if you hit this very sparse matrix with this very sparse vector x, b is going to be like mostly zeros, pretty much no matter which sparse vector you started from. Okay. So again, you, you wind up not getting information about the sparse vector x. All right. So at the very least, a better not be super sparse. Okay. So it's also we're not also we're also not not thinking we're going to prove that this is solvable for all a. Okay. So those are some lines in the sand. And so the questions we're going to ask is how, how big does M have to be and what extra conditions on A do we need before, first of all, again, at least in principle, there's a unique k-sparse vector x that solves this problem. And then secondly, we have an algorithm that will find it for us. Okay. So any questions about that? About the definition of the problem or why it's interesting? Yep. Why is that log in? Like, what's the intuition behind the log? That's just, uh, again, this was, uh, so the vague intuition was, uh, this is just sort of log of uh, n choose k. So these are the number of different supports of size k you could have in an n vector. And so somehow, like, this is some kind of, like, if you think of it in terms of entropy or information, you know, this sort of amount of uncertainty in what x could be, seems to be sort of lower bounded by this quantity. And if you sort of believe that each row of A is only going to give you a constant amount of information, then you would need this many rows. Again, that's heuristic. I mean, the real, there, there is a real proof of it. There is a real proof of lower bounds, but it's, uh, I'm just, I'm intentionally giving you a cartoonish version of the, of the intuition. Okay. So. Other questions? Okay, so let me, uh, let me actually tell you the algorithm before I tell you about the conditions on A. Okay, so we're going to be able to do this uh, without actually many more assumptions than these obvious ones, um, or these, you know, intuitive ones. And the algorithm is going to be in the same spirit as last lecture, in that we're going to look at a linear relaxation of the problem. And we're going to show that actually the um, exact solution under some extra conditions of that linear program is exactly the case sparse vector that we want. Okay. So again, it's just we're going to solve a linear program and then it's just going to be returned to us on a silver platter, which is great. And in fact, this whole field basically was born because you know, the, problem, the problems, it started from the applications and people tried this heuristic and then they observed they got exact solutions back when they weren't expecting it at all. And then they asked, okay, what's, what's a theory that would explain that? And that's really the origin story for compressive sensing. Okay. So, so the algorithm, we're going to solve a linear program. And, uh, you know, clearly one of the, some of the constraints are going to be this, right? So we're given A, we're given B, we're looking for a, we, you know, we have some parameter K, we're looking for a case bar solution. So in particular, it better be a solution. And uh, 
So trying to directly say minimize the number of non-zeros of a feasible solution, that's an NP-hard problem, it turns out. Okay? It has a discrete flavor, right? so it's not shocking. If you just say amongst all solutions to this, find the one with the minimum number of non-zeros. We can't do that. That's sometimes called L0 minimization. We're going to do heuristic, which is called L1 minimization. And again, the motivation is this is something we can formulate as a linear program. And as we've discussed, linear programs can be solved efficiently, both theoretically and efficiently. Okay. So here's the exact encoding. So this is going to correspond to the L1 norm of the vector x. So remember the L1 norm is the sum of the absolute values of the coordinates. And we already saw on Wednesday how to encode absolute values as linear inequality. So we're going to do that again here. So um, yi is at least xi and yi is also at least minus xi. Okay. So for i equal 1 up to k. All right. So this is just a direct formulation of saying amongst all feasible solutions to this linear system, compute the one that has the smallest L1 norm, the smallest sum of absolute values of coordinates. Okay, that's exactly what this problem says. This is not the problem we care about or that we set out to solve, and there's no reason why one should expect this to work. Okay? You really, I think, would first expect, if you solve this, what you'd get back is a solution to this linear system which probably has a non-zero value in every coordinate, and it's just like super small in most of the coordinates. Right? Like if you have an epsilon and a coordinate, you're only penalized epsilon in this objective function. But for the objective function we care about, number of non-zeros, you're penalized one. You're penalized for the whole coordinate. The same as if it's epsilon over it's 100. Right? So that, at least that's what I would have expected this heuristic to do. Yeah? So we're just trying to minimize the first k um, coordinates of x? Uh, no. So the real problem is minimize the number of non-zero coordinates. Right. Yeah. Um, sure, is, what is this problem? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, in, in, this, in this formulation, by writing i as 1 to k, are we just trying to minimize the n? Oh, this should be n. I'm sorry. Oh. My mistake. That was a typo. Thanks. Yeah. I got it right here. So I'm from Michael and the n. Yeah. Okay. So there's really no reason to expect this to work. Okay. And I don't think anyone. You know, I don't think people, it's, I doubt people would have thought to prove this theorem unless they actually just had the empirical evidence, you know, slapping them in the face. Okay. Okay. So, so here's the main result of this lecture, which is if we take M to be K log N, which seems sort of like a back of the envelope calculation to be roughly about the best we could hope for. Um, and we let A be random. So random here can mean a few different things. Okay? Um, so one thing would just be you populate each entry with a plus or minus one, 50-50, everything IID. Another thing would be you just populate each one with a random Gaussian. Okay? So a normal distribution, zero, one. Obviously this gives you a dense matrix. We know you need a dense matrix. Okay? But it turns out lots of sort of ID ways of populating the matrix A work. Okay, the, old, the end result is not super sensitive uh, to the definition of a random matrix. Then, with high probability over the choice of A, right? If they're random Gaussians, you might get super unlucky. And maybe all the entries are zero, but probably not, right? So with high probability over the choice of A, it's the case that for all k-sparse vectors x, so no matter what the ground truth is, with a x hat equal to b. So again, we're sort of thinking in our minds like x hat existed already, and then we're choosing a, and that induces b, according to a x hat b. Okay? So for all k-sparse x hat, that's a solution to the system a b. X hat is the unique solution to this LP. Okay. 
All right, so the plan of how we're going to go about this is sort of similar in spirit to how we analyze the single link plus plus algorithm. So you might recall a week ago, what we did is we said, okay, well, we have this algorithm, clearly it's not always going to work. Let's first identify some sufficient conditions on an instance under which this algorithm will be correct. And then let's argue that in that, in that context, it was a stability property. Let's argue why the stability property implies that these sufficient conditions are met. So for this, the work we're going to do in lecture is we're going to identify sufficient conditions on A, on the matrix, the constraint matrix, so that we get what we want, so that we actually, the LP solves to the exact solution. Then it's going to be the case, and we're not going to prove this part, that a random matrix A does satisfy these sufficient conditions. Okay? All right, so for which A's is this going to work? All right. So let's do, I need to do some preliminaries, okay? It's kind of geometric preliminaries about different norms, okay? So, it's clear we care, care about the L1 norm, right? Because that's what this linear program is about. It's not going to be totally obvious right now why we care about the L2 norm, but we're going to need to compare them. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, as we discussed, L1 norm, sum of absolute values, L2 norm is the square root of the sum of the squares. Right? So that's something all of you should have seen. Uh, as far as, you know, one thing that's helpful to maybe keep in mind, based on the next couple of things I'm going to say, is the sort of geometry of these norms. You often visualize the geometry of norm in terms of the unit ball. Okay, so you ask, Fix a norm, what is the set of points that have a unit norm? What does that look like? Okay. So for the L2 norm, that's familiar to all of you, that's just the circle. So let me ask you, so the unit ball for L1, so the points with L1 norm, that's either contained inside this ball I'm drawing, or alternatively, maybe it's entirely outside. So which of those two possibilities is it? Inside. Inside, that's right. What's the, what would you call the shape of the L1 ball? Kite. I would call it a diamond, yeah. Kite, is that what you said? <laughs> it's good too, yeah. Yeah, diamond was the first thing I was thinking. So this is the L1 ball, and this is the L2 ball. So for example, this would be the point, you know, uh, this would be the point one half, one half, which is, has a L1 norm one, for example, okay? So in general, L1 is the convex whole of the basis vectors and their negatives, all right? Good. So let's recall the relationship between the two norms for any vector. So if we're in Rn, and uh, I want to ask how much bigger or how much smaller could the L, the L1 norm be relative to the L2 norm? Well, so something we see immediately here is that the L1 norm is always at least as big, right? The one norm is always at least as big, right? Because this, here's something that has L1 norm 1, and the L2 norm is smaller, right? So in other words, yeah, okay. So everything that has L1 norm 1 has L2 norm 1 or less. And all this stuff is scale invariant, so you may as well just focus on the unit balls, okay? So the L1 norm is only bigger, and for what kinds of vectors is this tight? It's tight at the corners, right? At the basis vectors, right? So if one, one, and the rest are zeros, both of these evaluate to one, right? So tight uh, at the at uh, basis at uh, yeah, let's say sparse well basis vectors. All right. So where do they seem the farthest apart? What kinds of vectors? So when all the coordinates are equal, 
right? So when all the coordinates are equal, how much bigger is the two norm compared to the one norm? Or sorry, the other way around. How much bigger is the one norm compared to the two norm? The ratio of d, d is the dimension. Try it again. Square root d. Okay, so think about the vector that's all ones. Right? The L1 norm is n, the L2 norm is root n. Okay. And so this is tight when all coordinates are equal. Right? So like if we look at this gap here, that's going to be a gap of root 2 okay, between those two norms in that direction. All right? OK, good. So here's a, here's a definition. So we're going to say that x is spread out for a parameter c uh, if it's sort of much closer to satisfying this inequality with equality than that one. Okay? So it's sort of a generalization of all the coordinates being equal. So formally, we say that this holds in the reverse direction with an extra constant slack. Okay? So this basically means geometrically that we're somewhere far from the basis vectors. Okay? We're somewhere much more kind of in the middle of these slices. Okay? If you want to think in three space and you want to think about the sphere, okay, this means you, know, you can imagine sort of uh, you know, the great circles corresponding to the axes and we should be sort of far from those. We should be more in one of the middle of the eight orthons. So I don't know if you have this intuition, but as you pass from two dimensions to three dimensions, I'm going to plant the seed that maybe you know, many more x's are spread out once you go to three dimensions than when you're in two dimensions. OK. So I'll give you intuition about why we're talking about this stuff as soon as I can, but I need to cover a few preliminaries to get to that intuition. So intuitively, hmm, that's okay. So the key point, so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to state a technical statement, which hopefully sounds like it should obviously be true, given the intuition I've, I've developed for what this is. Um, but basically, what this lemma is going to say, and this is, what, this is the property of these spread out vectors we're actually going to use, which is that if you look at its L1 norm, okay? And then you just zoom in on a small set of the coordinates of a spread out vector. You capture a very small fraction of its overall L1 norm. Okay, this is totally the opposite of a sparse vector. Right? A sparse vector, if you zoom in on its k non-zero coordinates, you get all of its L1 norm. So we're saying spread out, if you zoom in on just like, say, k coordinates, you get very little. Okay? Clearly you can capture like k over n of the original one, but you can't capture like a lot like most of it if k is small. Okay? So this is, this is the property these things are really going to need. All right. So consider a subset of the coordinates. You know, maybe think of it being like root n of the coordinates or something like that. If you have a spread out vector, then So I'm using this notation to say just focus only on the contribution from the uh, coordinates in I. Okay? So uh, you can either think of zeroing out you know, the vector x on the rest of its coordinates outside of I, or you can just think of just restricting the sum to these coordinates. And so ultimately we want to say this is not too much of its overall L1 norm. Oh yeah, so this is just true. Good. Okay, so first of all, so what did we say here? Okay, here we said that when you have n coordinates, 
the L1 norm can only exceed the L2 norm by a factor of root n. Okay, so here we have cardinality of i coordinates. So if we switch to the L2 norm, it's only going to get a blow up of the square root of the number of coordinates, square root of cardinality of i. Okay? So that's the same, uh, the same square root as we had there. So times the L2 norm. And then using that it's uh, C spread out, we just pick up an extra C over square root of n. of the L1 norm, okay? So ultimately, you know, we care about the first term and the third term, which are both about the L1 norm of this vector. So again, this is just some of the absolute values. And we sort of use, we pass the Euclidean norm in the middle, basically to pick up the square root and to leverage the fact that it's C spread out, okay? The definition of C spread out is in terms of the L2 norm, but really what we care about is this consequence just for the L1 norm. To interpret this, you know, maybe think of, um, sorry, too many square roots here. Think maybe of C as like a constant and think of I as being sublinear. Okay, that would be one case. And then, that, then this would be a sublinear fraction. Uh, this would be a sublinear fraction of the, of the original L1 norm. For us, we're actually going to be taking C to be the square root of N over K and we're going to take the cardinality of i to be k. Okay? I'll, I'll show you that when we get there. Okay? So this is what we're going to use. All right. Any questions about that? So again, just given if we believe that it's a good definition of spread out, you'd expect properties like this to hold. So now I can tell you about, uh, so finally I'm going to tell you the condition. This is the sufficient condition on the matrix A, the constraint matrix under which uh, the LP heuristic will work. So we can say that the constraint matrix is C good if we look at everything in its kernel, okay, so meaning all vectors, which when A applied to it vanish, that are non-zero, every single thing in its kernel is spread out. Okay, in this sense. All right. So if all non-zero y in the kernel of A, which remember is defined as the y such that A y equals zero, is C spread out. Okay. So this is going to be our sufficient condition. Right. So this, of course, is much less immediately interpretable than the sufficient conditions we were working with last week. So last week we had these stability properties, we had this narrative saying that in the instances that arise in practice, we're sort of hoping there's this sort of pronounced optimal solution, this meaningful solution. So that was kind of our non-mathematical story about why stability was a good condition. Here, if you just stare at this, this is clearly just a technical definition, right? And there's no real story for this directly. But then there's this other part of the proof which says, well, but if you pick A at random, it's gonna have this property. So kind of most constraint matrices, and in particular random linear measurements, if we're designing the measurements ourselves, work fine. Okay? So keep that in mind. Okay, so geometrically what this is sort of saying, so remember, you know, this is a subspace, okay, this kernel. And so what it's saying, I mean it's hard in low dimensions, but it's basically saying, you know, if you have a one-dimensional kernel, then you know it's far more likely to be sort of in these directions that are far from the basis vectors as opposed to being really closely aligned to one of these basis vectors for a random A or for a random subspace. And again, try to develop the intuition that if we pass from two dimensions to three dimensions and we again think about the sphere and we think about the three-dimensional analog of the diamond embedded in the sphere, even more than here, most directions are not that close to the axes. Okay, they're mostly piercing through somewhere in the middle of one of these orthons. Okay, and that only gets more and more true as you pass to higher and higher dimensions. If okay. even one was close to an axis, we would be in trouble, right? What do you mean even one? Um, even one what? Like if, like, let's, say, let's say it's a higher dimensional kernel, so it's like a plane, right? So if the plane is close to one axis, 
then that means that we have a bad egg. Right, so maybe you want to think about like a globe and then a plane going through it. Yeah. Right, and so basically the plane should not be getting close to any of these axes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but again, I mean with, this, with higher dimensional stuff, the, the you know, analogies with low dimensional space only go so far. But. That's in effect, in hindsight, that's in effect what's happening, given, given, what we, given what one can prove is true. Okay, so. So fact, if we take M to be K log N, then a random A, and the various senses of random A I mentioned earlier, the parameter we're going to use is one fourth square root of n over k good. Oh, I forgot to say. So, like, what, what kind of c should we be hoping for? Okay. So, remember the definition of spread out. Okay. So, here, for a given vector x, c is going to be somewhere between 1 and square root n. Okay. So, this is 1 if it's everywhere. Uh, equal, and it's going to be root n if it's one of the basis vectors, okay? So, you know, what is this saying? This is saying, you know, the, um, as a function of the sparsity k that we're shooting for, this is kind of saying how much, you know, below the trivial bound of root n we're getting the spread out property in the kernel of this constraint matrix A, okay? So again, you might want to think of like k to be root n, and then this would be like n to the one-fourth, okay? Which is obviously, you know, Significantly, if you think about it, it's significantly closer to that inequality than that inequality. When you say a random A is this good, you're saying all random A are this good? What do you, I'm not saying, I'm not saying a random A is this good with probability one. You're saying there's some constant probability. Uh, good, so with high probability. So yes, being imprecise. I'll continue to be imprecise, but at least I'll be suggestive about what I actually mean. So with probability tending to zero as n tends to infinity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Okay, so this I'm not going to prove. Uh, it doesn't, you know, there are proofs that, you know, don't require anything you don't know. But it would take a while. I mean, it would take, I don't know, certainly an hour, probably more, to prove this. So I'm just going to put a link to a couple blog posts that I think are sort of enlightening on the topic on the course website. Okay, so we're going to take this uh, just as a given. All right. Another, I don't know how many of you have studied error correcting codes very much, but it might be, for those of you who have, it's worth keeping that as an analogy with what we're doing here. So when you study error correcting codes, right, one way to define linear codes is through its parity check matrix. So think of that as an analog to our A. And the code words correspond to elements of the kernel. Okay, so now we're doing linear algebra over F2, not over the reals, say in the binary case. So linear code words are just kernels of matrices. And one is typically concerned with studying error correcting codes with large distance, where each two code words have a large Hamming distance between them. For linear codes, that's equivalent to just asking amongst all non-zero code words, which one has the lowest Hamming weight, which one has the fewest number of non-zeros. So good binary linear codes are exactly the matrices for which the, every single thing in the kernel has a lot of non-zeros. So here, we're just saying the good sort of constraint matrices A are those for which everything in the kernel is spread out, okay? So in general, these, you know, not only have a lot of non-zeros, but they also satisfy properties like this, which say if you sort of zoom, if you, if you forget about just counting the number of non-zeros, if you actually count, keep track of L1 norm, count L1 norm, you have an analogous property, where the, not only, not only are the, not only do you not have all of the L0 weight concentrated on few coordinates, you also do not have most of the L1 weight concentrated on few coordinates. Okay? So you can sort of think of this as asking for sort of a more demanding version in terms of real values and L1 norm of what you typically ask for for binary linear codes. Okay. All right, so we're ready to prove the theorem, which I erased. Okay? So the theorem which says if you pick a random A, and k is at least uh, constant times, uh, sorry, if m is at least k log m times a constant, then the LP algorithm works with high probability. Okay. And if you're willing to take this on faith, all I need to show is that for uh, matrix A, which is one quarter root n over k good, I need to show that for such matrices, this is our sufficient condition, the LP solves to the optimal, to the uh, k sparse vector that we want. 
So any questions before we do that? Yep. I guess we'll see, but um, does the with high probability come from this fact? Like, yes. So, so given C good, A is C good. Exactly. So the proof I'm going to do, I'm going to go from here on out, says assume that A is good to this. Then deterministically, it'll work. Yeah, good question. Other questions? All right, so we can forget about all this stuff. All we're going to need is this, this property here. All right, so let me just set up the notation, and then I'll tell you the intuition of what we're going to do, OK? So proof, and again, what we're going to show that if A is good, LP works. So from here on out, all norms are L1 norms. Okay, we only had to pass to the L2 norm to you know talk have that one definition. Okay, I forgot to say, you know, if you, if you want to look it up further, um, these types of subspaces where everything is spread out, these are called almost Euclidean subspaces. That's the technical word for it. Okay, um, but you don't you don't have to remember that. That's only if you want to read more about it. Okay, so now from here on out, everything is an L1 norm. So what does this mean that the LP works? We need to show that if you show me any feasible solution to that linear system, so if A W equals B, then the L1 norm of W exceeds that of X at the planted solution. Okay? So if this is true, then when we minimize the L1 norm over all feasible solutions, we're going to get back x hat. Agreed? All right. So <coughs> here's the intuition. So suppose, so x hat, remember, by assumption, satisfies this linear system. If W does also, then x hat and W differ by a vector in the kernel of the matrix A. Right? They're both feasible solutions. All right? Now, x is sparse. Right? So all its L1 norm is concentrated on just k coordinates. On the other hand, anything in the kernel is spread out. Okay, so its L1 norm is everywhere. So if you look at x hat plus something from the kernel of this matrix, all right, you're going to have very little cancellation because x has all of its norm on so few coordinates, and something in the kernel has so much of its L1 norm in other coordinates. So when you add them together, they can't cancel much. So you get a vector with bigger L1 norm. That's basically what happens. All right. So let me actually show you that that really works. So write W as x hat plus y for y in the kernel of A. Okay. So y is just defined as the difference between the two. And by assumption of A being good, we know that Y is 1 quarter square root of N over K spread out. Okay? And, you know, I hope it was clear from the intuitive argument, you know, we're going to use the fact that X has all of its stuff in just K coordinates, and then Y has to have most of its stuff in the other coordinates. All right? So we, we're going to handle the two sets of coordinates separately. So we're going to let, let I be the support of X, sorry, the support of X hat, I should say. And then J are the other coordinates. Okay, I complement. So I has cardinality at most K, right? Because X hat is K sparse. And then J is at least the other at least N minus K coordinates. Right? All right, so then. So we, we're going to consider W's L1 norm. We need to say it's big, okay, strictly bigger than X's. Okay? So we're going, to, we're going to track its L1 norm separately for the coordinates in I, where all of X's stuff is, and in the other coordinates, where X has nothing. Okay? So let's write W. Uh, so we just break it into the two parts. 
All right, so the L1 norm is just additive, so I can just sort of freely focus on two sets of coordinates separately. Um, Alright, let me do it this way. So let me also expand. So W's, I'm, I've written as x plus y, x hat plus y. So, what is this? This can be simplified. Good, 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 good. Yep, so x hat is zero everywhere here, right? So this equals just the jth coordinates of y, okay? So let's think about how we can simplify this, all right? And remember, we're trying to lower bound w's norm, okay? Saying it's bigger than x. So we want to sort of extricate x from this interaction with y over here. So note, all right, so we're, gonna, so we're just going to focus on this term for a second. All right, so, and keep in mind sort of the motivation here, right? So x has all its stuff in these coordinates. And looking ahead, because y spread out, it can't have much stuff in these coordinates. Okay, so keep that in mind. So, how small could this possibly be? Well, sort of in the worst case, on each of these coordinates, x and y have opposite signs, okay? So you get cancellations. I just remember L1 norm is the absolute value, but when you add two vectors, if you have a minus one and a one, it becomes zero, right? So as far as the lower bound, that's sort of the worst that could happen, okay? They have opposite signs, you get cancellation. So that leads us to um, the total amount of stuff x has on these coordinates minus the total amount of stuff y has on these coordinates. Okay. And this is x hat, right? Oh, excuse me, yeah. Thank you. Actually, we're gonna use this for y, I shouldn't do that. That's gonna get really confusing. Okay. So in fact, it's also lower bounded by the opposite term. I could take y minus x, that would be a second lower bound that looks legitimate, but this is the only one I'll need. Okay? Which makes sense because we're sort of thinking that like x is the one with all the stuff in these coordinates and y doesn't have much. Okay, so where does that leave us? This of course is also just the overall L1 norm of x, right? Because it only has stuff on i anyways, all right? So let's, uh, the dust settles and we get that the norm of w is lower bounded by the norm of x hat minus the norm of y just on the coordinates in i plus the overall norm of y. Okay? Y sub j. Y sub j. Yes, y sub j. Thank you. No, 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 no. I and J, minus I plus J. Ah. Yes. No, that's the J, isn't it? Oh, I see, the minus is the I, okay. <laughs> plus the J, let's do it this way. Minus the I. Good? Yeah. All right. Okay, so, um, the next trick, so this we're pretty happy of if we think about it. So let, let's look ahead. So ultimately, so we haven't used the, this one property we have about y being spread out, which means that if we sort of project onto uh, any subset of the coordinates, it's not gonna get much of the L1 norm. Now remember, i is sort of the small set, okay? i has size of most k, we're thinking of that as being small, j is the rest. So this, we're gonna have some ability to control, okay? So to the point that even, let's just think of, express this, as the, L, the L1 norm of y minus the L1 norm in just the coordinates of i. Okay. 
So now it's time to invoke the fact that y is well spread out. So using star over here. So we have our i, this is at most k, okay, because uh, because it's uh, x was k sparse. C, we've agreed, is 1 fourth times root n over k. Yeah. All right, square root of k over n. So this is at most half the L1 norm of y. Okay, so we're left with something positive. And uh, so that gives us that W's L1 norm is at least that of x hat. Okay. So that's proof. Any questions about that? All right. Elliot. Could you say what, um, why the i-coordinates of x hat are equal to the norm of y, or of x, sorry? Yeah, it's just because it's, um, just cause it's uh, sparse. So, it's, uh, so x hat is our, is our ground truth k-sparse vector. Oh, it's equal to x hat, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Yep. Um, couldn't we have chosen something better than one before? Yep. Um, so does that not affect like the probability? Thing? It does. It does. Yeah. I often make. Uh, I often will give up a little bit on uh, uh, sort of the sharpness of the result if I think it'll make my handwriting a little more okay. easy, easy to read in lecture. So, so having kind of a one over two plus epsilon everywhere yeah. didn't seem like a very good idea. Yeah. Okay. So, other questions? <laughs>